I'm Jared Gardner. I'm a professor of English uh, and also director of the Humanities Collaboratory, and, and I work with the Humanities Centers Consortium. And um, I am the co-curator of this exhibit. And I'm Beth Hewitt. I'm also a professor in the English department. Um, and I am also the director of undergraduate studies of the department. And I am the other co-curator of the exhibit. A lot of our exhibits begin in the exhibition committee with uh, where I sit with Caitlin and, and Jenny and Anne and others here at the Billy Ireland. And we think about things that we know that students and faculty and members of the community are interested in. So that was kind of where it began, but ultimately that's obviously not what becomes the driving through line of the exhibit. Once Beth and I start working on it, then we start to try and let the material tell its, tell its own story. Right, yeah, I mean, I think I'm, I wasn't at the meeting when you first decided it. I, I, I feel that, that a lot of what was driving it for us was the sense that young people are thinking about the environment, about climate change um, a lot, um, and that, that we were eager to bring a media that they were also very familiar with to that particular subject. Most of the comics, or not, maybe not most, but I would say probably two thirds, all pre-exist our students' age. You know, they're all from anywhere between the 60s and the, and the 90s. Um, but I still, I think Jared and I've talked about this, we always feel like our students are more are visually very literate. Um, and so part of, I know, what we, you and I talked about is that we really wanted it to be not an education about environmentalism, but an exhibit that would actually allow them to see how environmentalism has been depicted at various moments and times in, in comics because it's such a, um, it is such an accessible media in many ways for them. So mm -hmm. I know that that was part of what we Absolutely. thought about. Yeah, and as we got further into it, it was it definitely, you know, I always, maybe I think it's just because these kinds of questions always interest me, I became interested in why comics, that kind of big question. Why, why have comics so long been kind of particularly interested in this topic? What, what drew cartoonists to be observing and reflecting upon the kind of devastations that human activity was bringing to the environment? Um, and, you know, there's, I wanted to be able to have an answer to that question. I think I have some answer to that question. But I also wanted to think about, and I know this is something that Beth and I talked about constantly, what is it about comics that might actually allow it to rewire thinking and rewire minds about the ways in which we might finally begin to meaningfully address the challenges we face that frankly film and novels and, and other narrative forms haven't been able to do. When when we were going through the show, one of the pieces that I actually think t tell, explains that really well um, is um, the crumb yeah. um, image that's over on, on that wall, which is what, 12 panels, is that right? Yep. 12 panels. Um, and I think it's called the History of, history the history of, of America. America. Short History of America. America. Yeah. Um, and in, in just 12 silent panels, and it is interesting how many silent comics we have in our yeah. show, and I think that's worth thinking about. But we basically go from this scene of of wilderness trees before settler before, colonialism yeah exactly and then by the time we get to the end we have a landscape that's that's essentially a suburban strip mall that's what it looks like it's not an urban space it's definitely suburban and you see the slow transformation over the course of 12 panels and presumably you know like four centuries right? exactly we yeah. assume that that much time has taken place and so kind of going back to something jared said earlier i think i think the thing that comics potentially does that other media doesn't do is it allows it allows for the telescoping of time mm -hmm. such that people can actually instead of thinking oh it'll be fine i can go back to this place right. you can kind of see oh, actually human beings exist in time and this is what happens to a space over extended periods of time. And, um, and, it, and you don't go back or you don't just wish, wishfully go back that right. that kind of nostalgic view of the first generation of cartoonists, which again, I'm not criticizing them, I would have shared it, but the view that there is this pristine world of nature I can always return to is no longer one we can we can assume and as beth said i think that power to 
allow us in one single page to see 400 years passing. And to kind of, because when we read comics, we're not reading just one panel at a time, we're seeing, you know, through our peripheral vision, all of it. So we're being able through comics to see time in the way environmental solutions require. They require us to see beyond the present quarterly report, beyond the present moment, beyond the immediate exploitation of resources towards thinking about long-term effects, thinking about what's gonna happen after we're gone, what's gonna happen, what was this place before we got here. We're not trained, quite frankly, by most of our other narrative media, including novel and film, to think that way, right? We tend to have the hero's journey. We tend to have, um, you know, very much- uh, Small units of time. Small units yeah. of time. I mean, there are obviously huge exceptions, but nothing, I really don't, and I, I don't like to make exceptional claims for comics, but I'll, I will. Um, I don't think there's any form that can represent as efficiently huge eons of time spread out across a page. Right. And that is the time and pretty much all kind of environmental thinkers who are trying to kind of wonder how do we get past this impasse in our thinking that's preventing us from moving forward. One of the things we always come back to is we have a, a system of, of capitalism, of global interconnectedness that all depends on being very much in sync in the current moment. And future thinking and past thinking is, we don't have the luxury of it, but that isn't a luxury, it's a necessity. We have to learn how to think in the, how the present connects always to the past and the future if we're gonna ever get out of this, this crisis we're heading towards. Uh, deep time. <laughs> deep time, right. yeah, thinking, thinking in Earth time. Right. I mean, and some of the later cartoonists that we have in our contemporary section of the exhibit are trying to find ways to kind of building on Crumb's early experiment from the early 80s, thinking of ways of using the comics form's ability to think in different modes of time, mm -hmm. to narrate across different structures than the, you know, the, the kind of coming of age and, and decline and fall of the hero, but instead thinking about populations and planets, uh, that there might be ways that we could use comics to actually transform radically our relationship to the environment. Right. And that's, we wanted to end on a hopeful note because, you know, uh, nothing <laughs> happens. If we give up hope, nothing happens. And, and I think that was the other thing we were struck by is how much so many contemporary cartoonists who work in this area, and there are more and more of them every year, they can be very heartbroken. They can be very angry, but they're all also very hopeful. Um, they really do believe that this is, this is something we are capable of, that, that things, our, our inability to take the action necessary is not something inherent to us as humans. It's something that is kind of built into the structures that we've come to depend on, and we can step out of them. We can, it is not too late for us to. Think, think, think differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, what we've tried to do, we kind of organized the exhibit around different kinds of meditations, different media. Um, you know, so we've got, there's, there's part, parts of the exhibit are, are devoted to comic books, some are devoted to comic strips, some are editorial comics, some are more contemporary comics, um, superheroes. Uh, and so we kind of imagined, you know, here are different comic forms. How do they differently represent different kinds of issues um, involving environmental degradation. Um, so I think that you know, par part of it is we imagined ourselves um, trying to pursue this intersection between form <laughs> and, yeah. um, and topic. Um, oh, I, like, I think that's great. And you know, just thinking about the very different tasks of a daily editorial cartoonist, for example, who is going to be thinking, for example, about the debates around you know, the, the pygmy owl and its potential to interrupt uh, road work projects in Arizona, right? That's a very, that's something very specific. And we have a editorial cartoon that particularly addresses that mm -hmm. issue and coming from a cartoonist who is based in Tucson. That makes sense because that local daily perspective is what drives the way in which they look at the world. That's very different than a daily comic strip artist, right? Who is thinking always about their relationship to their characters and their characters' relationship to their readers 
and how those evolve over time. So right. somebody like um, you know, Bill Watterson with Calvin and Hobbes is, what I was thinking is developing you know, a very different voice to talk about very similar issues. That's not rooted in a very one particular piece of policy or politics, but is thinking bigger about through the lens of this very wise, rambunctious boy about you know, how we might learn to value nature as much or even more than the short-term gains that we exploit from it. And I, that's something that also fascinates us. I, no, I noticed, I was thinking about the Watterson piece, because I, I mean, I think you're right, and it, it does, it takes us through a story. It, it, one of the things that, you know, I didn't think about this when we were planning the show, but it, a, lot of, a lot of the stories that we think the show tells, I don't think we realized until we no. were actually putting things up yeah. on the wall. But one of them I realized is how prominent children are in um, the, the images. Um, so the Watterson is, a, I think part of the reason that's such a powerful sequence is that we do have um, Calvin and Hobbes like as children, you know, yeah. as a children in a children's toy being there, they are talking about development, uh, you know, the ways in which developers come in, raise um, a, a landscape and then put in houses that the children can't participate in. Like you get that thematic. There are at least four pieces, I think, in the show in which someone um, says, and all of this will not be yours to a child. Right. So that there's this kind of this, this sense in which the betrayal, um, the, of the, children. the betrayal of the children. This is like a yeah. thematic that kind of keeps coming up over and over again. Um, and, and so, I, and we, I think it's part of what our students really connect with, right? I mean, our students, and they they'll talk about this openly in class. They very much understand that so much of the current crises that we face are crises that were brought about by previous generations unable to see what seems to them so patently obvious, and not to let our generation off the hook by any means. But one of the other things that this exhibit does, it shows that people were thinking about it. They were seeing and arguing for um, in, in very organized ways, at least since the early 60s, um, and trying to find ways to get those stories heard. Right. That can... doesn't justify the, the failure to get those stories heard, but you do see that uh, the... the kind of growing desperation yeah. from early on. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you said 60s, and that's absolutely true, but we even have earlier pieces. Yeah. I mean, and I think that was a story that we wanted to tell, which is that there is a history to the environmental movement. It's mostly a post-60 history, but really from the beginning of industrialization and urbanization, there has been a recognition that what human beings do has, has detrimental consequences to the environment. Um, and then there was something you said, we, we had a group of students, um, uh, I think it was the, the first group of students we had, and you mentioned something, and I really hadn't thought about when we did the show, but it strikes me as being really interesting, which is we think about comics as being a very urban form. It, like, it, it's largely written by people who maybe they grew up in a rural environment, but they came to a city. Especially that first generation. Especially that yeah. first generation. They, it, it gets published in urban newspapers. A lot of the iconography of early comics is the apartment building, yeah. the cityscape. Um, and so it, it, really, it really strikes me as interesting that comics is so much an urban form and also from the very get-go has been really, really interested in thinking about the ways that a particular version of urban life um, has, has consequences yeah. for, the, for, you know, for, the, for the broader globe, I guess I would say. Yeah. I mean, the big difference, we have, a, we have a case that has some 19th century examples and they're all very much focused on water pollution and air pollution, which were the kind of two first environmental crises that urban observers noticed in the 19th century in, in London and, and in, uh, later in New York. And most of those cartoonists, as Beth said, were folks who had grown up, you know, in small towns in northern Ohio, for example, and then moved to New York because that's where newspaper comics were being published. But I think even then, when they recognized the city as, you know, because they are keen observers, they they're, have trained themselves to see the world around them with a critical eye, so they can see that this is not good, but they still believed, and that's the big change that I think this exhibit really does highlight, they still believe that it's okay, I can go back to Northern Ohio and right. perfect nature will still be there. Right. Like this is a contained problem in the 19th century imagination. 
By the end of the 19th century, the first word begins to really circulate that human beings had brought about the extinction of an animal in the United States that turned out to be a near extinction, which is the American bison. Um, and it took a while for people to even fully accept that, that human beings had, direct, caused had, had really caused an extinction of an animal. The common belief, Darwin and others believed this, even though they were keenly aware of, of the way in which creatures came and went from the planet, the common belief was nature takes care of all that, right? We could never do that. As the 20th century dawns, it becomes really clear, holy cow, no, we are actually the Carolina parakeet. Um, you know, the dodo is one of the very first. That was obviously preceded all of this. It was kind of mythological and we didn't know much about it then, but it, they were starting to accelerate pretty fast in the 20th century. And that starts to immediately change on the margins of the conservation movement and understanding that something that we are doing is actually having direct impact on the natural world, maybe forever. But even then it was still in pockets. It was not mainstream in terms of a kind of consciousness that would be something that would be taught in the schools, for example. And that's what really changes. We, so we begin the exhibit with a picture of the the blue marble from uh, the Apollo missions, the, the first- Apollo 17, yeah. Apollo 17, the yeah. first image we have of, of the whole earth. Uh, and I mean, I remember as a kid, that image being something we would see in class, right? Yeah. So as, as we were young kids at the time, uh, I think pretty early in our school years. Yeah. Um, and that was, you know, I remember, you know, partly because I, I had just started school, that seemed cool. But I remember my teacher being like, this is huge because it really was a whole new way of seeing our own planet uh, and understanding its relative smallness, its fragility. Um, the big blue marble is also a very fragile egg. <laughs> and so one of the things we noticed as we first start going through all the art is how often that image of the big blue marble shows up in cartoon iconography. And so we wanted to begin with that in part because it really, I think, marks that first moment in coming out of the 60s and the first Earth Day in 1970, where for the first time, a, a kind of what we would think of as an environmental way of thinking really has gone mainstream for the first time. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you can visually, I mean, that, that was actually part of the reason we thought about the blue marble, because I don't know if I, I don't think, know if I thought about the, the, the connection between the, the Apollo 17 picture and the environmentalist movement. I'm sure that it's been made before. I just didn't know about it. But it was the fact that we kept seeing image after image yeah. of the whole globe inevitably with some, like all, they're, they're in the first wall of the exhibit, either covered by trash or covered by toxins or covered by gas or whatever it is. It's this, I think, very powerful image of this is all we have. <laughs> right. and, it, um, and it's vulnerable. Right? Yeah. And, and, and you know, part of the joy of working, of curating here, right? The incredible joy of, of working with the Billy Ireland is you begin by finding as many cool things in the collections <laughs> and you get to then go through them all and let them tell the, the story. story. Yeah. Let the objects begin to give us a, its own sense of what the story is rather than us try to impose it. So we had a vague sense of the story, but it's- We, a, had, we had a little fight even about it, remember? We did. Because, I because, lost. <laughs> you did. I lost. Because Jared's, uh, this is the first show I've ever curated, but Jared's done it before and, and we're both literary historians. So we tend to think very chronologically. We, I think we teach chronologically. Yeah. We tend to put things like, it's best to just follow chronology because then you're not imposing an order other than time. Um, and so we were gonna approach the show this way, and it was because of those images that all of a sudden we thought, you know, maybe actually this isn't the way to proceed, and that there might be a, another way to, yeah. to tell this particular, uh, to particular story about how comics have talked about the environment over the course of 100 years, or yeah. more than 100 years. And it's, and it's, I mean, that's the, and I love it. I just love that, we, that, that truly there's so much work here at the Billy Ireland in our collections that you can really begin with that understanding, that belief that you really are telling the authentic story of, of this history of cartooning. And then we can supplement it obviously with things from other sources, but everything 
always is told first by the collections that exist here. Yeah. I, I mean, I was thinking, you know, as you were talking, um, I mean, it's not going to come as any surprise because it's the image that we that we chose for a lot of the posters and things. So the Peter Cooper pieces mm -hmm. of the butterfly over these various um, these yeah. these spaces. And to a certain extent, I think it does it does precisely what you just described, only not so much in terms of time, but space. Yeah. You know, so it basically it it says, okay, you know, part of the reason again, it's hopeful, right? Yeah. Um, but it also says, you know, part of the reason that we have continually disappointment at the end of um, conferences about climate change, global conferences about climate change, is that countries see themselves as independent. Like this is my this is my landscape. This is what I care about. I don't want to do this. This is my landscape. And for me, the Cooper images with the the butterfly over these spaces is really an, another way to represent the blue marble. Like it's a way to say, in fact, actually this butterfly, this, you know, this beautiful, this beautiful um, form of fauna um, is located in all these spaces. In the conceit of the, the, the comic, it's actually traveling, it's yeah, migrating. Migratory. Um, but, it, but, but you don't, if you look at it as just a static image, you don't necessarily capture that. What you capture is that the world is interconnected. Um, and to me, that's a really important, yeah. uh, important piece. Yeah, um, these, borders, these borders are, are unnatural, right? right? They are arbitrary. They are, um, they are there for convenience. They're there um, for historical and political reasons but they are not in any way connected to the way in which the natural world functions. Um, and at some point we have to give up our, our commitments to these resources, this land is ours to exploit as we see fit and to be listening to nature to tell us how and why nature needs to be cared for. We've spent hundreds and hundreds of years exploiting nature uh, and it's time we now come together to think about how we help nature heal from the damage we've done. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the other um, uh, cartoons we have from Peter Cooper, who's one of our featured artists in this exhibit. So I think Peter Cooper has been working on comics about the environment since, really since like 79, 80. This has been, uh, and he's been part of a collective with other cartoonists deeply invested in environmental activism and, and uh, cartooning in a collective called World War III. Um, and he's worked in a, in a wide range of mediums, comic strips, New Yorker cartoons, and graphic novels. So he seemed perfect for us as a, as a kind of somebody to focus some attention on. But one of the pieces that's actually right here on the, on the wall in front of me is called Climate Unchanged. And it's a fairly recent piece. It's from uh, 2015. And it's, it's a chance for Cooper to visually kind of imagine the healing of the earth. It begins at the end. It begins with the earth in, in crisis, with everything in kind of literally on fire, and then represents imaginatively what it looks like as the earth recovers. Um, you know, the realization that in the end, the earth will be fine, right? The earth is going to heal. The question is, does it heal with us or does it heal without us? And while Cooper's vision imagines it healing without us, which is obviously not the ideal scenario, we're not rooting for that one, <laughs> it's still hopeful, right? Because it still reminds us that for all our hubris, you know, we can do incredible damage, but ultimately the damage we're doing is to us. Um, and the environment, for all we talk about its imminent destruction, the environment will outlive us. The question is, will we find a way back to a relationship to the environment that allows it to nourish us and, and us to return to our relationship as, as caretakers and beneficiaries of it. And for that reason, the other, I think, pieces that I think we both felt really kind of excited about and we kind of wanted to be some of the first images that people saw when they came at the show are uh, some uh, images that represent some perspectives and we can only choose a couple from so many uh, from uh, native and indigenous cartoonists who are working around issues uh, related to the environment today. There's so many amazing things happening, many of them being published by uh, native and indigenous presses, independent of the big commercial presses. Um, so we featured two artists, one an editorial cartoonist, 
um, who was deeply involved in, in creating some really powerful cartoons and images in relationship to the campaign against uh, DAPL. Um, and um, the other is a just amazing younger uh, cartoonist who uh, does work for you know places like Marvel and Dark Horse, but her real mission in, in life is to do as much as she can working with uh, Native and Indigenous uh, writers and publishers uh, that use genre fictions or the conventions of genre fictions like science fiction and horror um, to kind of imagine uh, other kinds of futures, other kinds of possibilities, and and you know, in some sense, uh, kind of alternative ways of inhabiting uh, and and caring for the world. That that in some ways, because of the way the world exists right now, often require the imaginative leaps that science fiction allows. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think it's it's also important to remember, um, you know, that this story is a story of our creation and um and there are other stories we can tell and i think in different ways from a range of different perspectives that's what so many of these cartoonists are about are, tr are trying to imagine yeah. different ways yeah yeah this is this is not this this is not predetermined nothing here is predetermined even now even on the brink of what you know because that's you know the worst fear i think so many environmentalists have is everybody says you know Oh well, I, I accept it, but it's too late. I can't do anything. So, whatevs. Um, that's that would be in some sense the most tragic fate of all. Um, and these these artists and writers are definitely committed to not letting that happen. happen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. A lot of the a lot of the more contemporary stuff is really a, a kind of meditation, using comics as a meditation to to really kind of reimagine human relationship with the natural world. Um, it, it's the owl piece is one of my um, one yeah of, one Maggie the, Umber's piece. Yeah. I really think that it's piece a, is wonderful. It's um, again, it's soundless, and and essentially the purpose. You know, I, I think if you if you saw the comic in a bookstore, I think you wouldn't think, oh, it's an it's an environmentalist piece. You'd rather think it's 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 educational. It's designed to like teach us about great horned owls. Um, but we we felt like it it really belonged um, because oh, the okay. because the the purpose of it really is to, to try to get the readers to think about, not really even to think about your relationship to great horned owls is different, but to think as if one is a great horned yeah. owl. Um, yeah. It's like and, a kind of virtual reality. Yeah, where you're yeah. living the life cycle of, of a, a great, of a horned, great owl. horned owl. And for me, like that was, I, I, I think fiction can do that. Again, I'm not, we're yeah. not making it, you know, I think that that's a, that's a great affordance of, of, of any kind Imagine of fictional fiction, world, imaginative yeah. world. But um, it, I found it really, really powerful. I finished the comic. I read it a few times, and I just every single time I just felt like I had seen the world with new eyes. So even though I wouldn't call it science fiction, it, it does for me the same thing that a lot of the science fiction comics that we have on display do, yeah. which is that they just they force us to to look at the world with entirely new eyes, um, which and I, estrange I think us yeah. and estrange us, yeah, yeah, yeah estrange yeah. us from yeah. what we think is the only way to look at the world. And that's what all good art does is tell us, no, there, this is not the only way to look at the world. This is not the only, yours, your eyes are not the only <laughs> eyes that one should look through. And in fact, not even just human eyes, right? There are, are lives being lived all around us, many of which are entirely invisible to us. Um, and one of our, our other kind of great heroes that we wanted to celebrate, Rachel Carson, the environmental right. activist who um, tragically died shortly after her greatest victory, uh, but who in 1963, through the sheer force of her writing um, and, and the strength of her, um, of her words, was able for the first time to really get uh, the entire nation to see how much damage we were doing through one choice that was just for our own convenience, the use of DDT to get rid of mosquitoes and, and pesty bugs and that was being used in every household in the United States in the 1950s. Um, and that was causing incredible destruction to wildlife and human beings, um, especially uh, children who were being exposed to it in huge numbers. But she had the genius to realize that 
she was a marine biologist by training, and she first began to notice it around her work with the, the, the wildlife of the shoreline. But she knew that people didn't care about mollusks and, and <laughs> such things, but they did care about bald eagles. And bald eagle populations were plummeting. Uh, and so she, you know, with the keen eye of a cartoonist, realized that uh, while they may not care about mollusks and jellyfish, uh, the, the national bird's imminent extinction is something that is likely to capture attention. And she was successful. She got congressional hearings, she got DDT banned, and she really mainstreamed both the understanding that human beings can and are doing incredible damage, uh, and B, that activists can make a difference. Mm -hmm. And I think for, you know, I know from so many folks who I've talked to who came of age in the late 60s, we were just little, little tots then, that who became lifelong environmentalists. They've told me that over and over again that, you know, Rachel Carson was the, the reason they got into it because this was somebody who was a beautiful writer, fairly mild-mannered, nothing particularly you know, dramatic or rock star about her, just using um, you know, good storytelling, good science, and uh, appealing to human beings to want to do better. Because in the end, we do want to do right. better. It's, I mean, and she also, she also makes the reader think into the future. Yeah. Um, I know I'm often struck by how many science fiction writers in the second half of the, the 1960s and the 70s, where we start, we start um, science fiction that's really interested in world destruction and apocalypse, becomes increasingly interested in environmental destruction as opposed to nuclear destruction. Right. And it's um, it, every time I read these novels, I always think how indebted they are to Carson. You usually yeah. see some kind of direct allusion um, because you can tell that these writers they they kind of took what she what she provided in a, in a scientific text, a popular scientific text, yeah. but a, you know a scientific text, and thought, okay, now let me imagine the world. <laughs> right. Um, so and she does it within the book. She'll say, imagine you know waking up one day and there are yeah. no bald eagles. Yeah. I mean, she. She'll walk us through scenarios, asking us to imagine what happens if we do nothing. Right. Uh, and I think, you know, that's, there's a reason why so many cartoonists loved her. And we have some of the tributes of cartoonists there to her, including Charles Schultz. Uh, Lucy from Peanuts was a, a massive fan of, of Rachel, Rachel Carson. Carson. <laughs> Lucy had a Rachel Carson bat, at, uh, which is... <laughs> A rare model. Um, I've never been able to track one down myself. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think, you know, again, I think so many cartoonists reading that work um, could see through her eyes. It was, it's a, such a vision, even though it's a prose book, it's very visual. She's thinking mm -hmm. in terms of symbols and icons and thinking, asking us to kind of dramatically propel ourselves into the future and see how that future looks. Do we like this future or not? For cartoonists, this is, I think they all read it and they thought, this, this makes sense. I can, mm -hmm. I can run with this. And they do. I mean, that's part of what this mm -hmm. exhibit primarily grows out of those kind of key moments. I think really three key moments within 10 years of each other. Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, the first Earth Day in 1970, and then the, the big blue marble photo from uh, the Apollo mission in 1972. It's a pretty, you know, some of the images are really fairly brutal um, and depressing, I mean, yeah. for lack of a better word. Um, and we really didn't want people to exit feeling hopeless or feeling despair. Um, I think, I mean, I, I, I guess what we hope is that people will read it feeling a little bit like they've had a fairly fast kind of experience like people in 1962 did of reading Silent Spring, which is um, concern. <laughs> um, and and urgency, but also motivation. Mm -hmm. um, I guess. I guess. And also, know. I think because so, I think people who come to this exhibit, I think you know, and I think the vast majority of us, I think we so underestimate how many of us there are who want to imagine a better future, right, in relationship to um, the the crisis that is upon us. I think because the voices of those who are you know, who claim to doubt the science or 
or who claim that anything that puts um, you know, the, the needs of nature and the environment ahead of human profit. I think we think those people are more because they are loud, but actually I'm, I'm quite convinced that uh, the overwhelming number of people, and I think it's among the younger generation, it's even more so. And I know this just from having you know, taught students over the last 30 odd years, the, the, the kind of engagement with environmentalism right now among young people is the strongest I've ever seen it. Mm. I think the other thing we hope they come out is this realization that they're not alone, right? That, that, that other people are, are feeling this, that if they're not talking about it as much in their circles, it's, it's because everybody feels overwhelmed by it. That that silence that we often feel is a sense of, of powerlessness. It's not a lack, it's not about apathy. And so I think, you know, as much as some of these images are brutal, they all believe in the power of human action. Even the darkest yeah. images that we see along the way are basically saying we could do it different. We don't have to go this way. There is this profound faith in our power to, to, to heal and repair our own perspectives, our own behaviors, and the planet around us. And I think that's the kind of hope we want people to come out with, that they're not alone in their concerns and their desires for different outcomes, um, and that there is, uh, that there is hope. Um, and that you know, there is a whole, their, their generation will find many, many allies in the older generations who, yes, we, we let them down, no <laughs> doubt about it, right? We, we did, but there are countless allies who are, eager to put our shoulders to the wheel alongside them. Um, and we certainly owe them that. There's a, there's a cartoon, I'm not gonna remember who it is, but you're gonna remember, the one with the boat. It's a, one of the first Earth Day comics. Oh, it's a good old, uh, old, old dispatch cartoonist, Eugene Craig. Eugene Craig. Yeah. Um, and in some sense, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty devastating image. It has a man in a boat and there's two, um, there's two rocks. One says apathy and one says hysteria. And he's navigating the, the the two shoals, as he puts as it puts it. But I find it actually a really empowering mm -hmm. comic. Um, I remember when we first I was like an adamant that we had to put it in the show. It's true. Um, I was like, oh, we've got a couple of Eugene Craigs. We're probably okay. And you were like, no, we need Cause, that. Because I find it really, I find it really inspiring. Like, yes, you don't have to. Like, these are not the only two options. One doesn't have to be hysterical and one doesn't have to be apathetic. Um, and both of them lead to paralysis. And right? both of them lead to paralysis, so yeah. So they're, yeah. they're not helpful. Um, and, and you're right, the fact that he is at, he is, he is steering the ship and the ship moves forward through those two extremes right, is, right. It's, he's is not, hopeful. It's not a shipwreck, yeah, right? <laughs> no. It's a, so. and, and, it's, <laughs> and he does, he does do that for the first Earth Day as, as a, you know, a, a faith that we can we can steer this forward. You know, Fifty years later, it can feel frustrating that we've made so little progress. Um, and you know, in many respects, we obviously have. But I think you know, some of what we've learned in terms of environmental science in you know the last 20, 30 years shows us that we were we were missing the the missing the point in when we first started. So. There's a lot of making up to do, but we have accomplished also some remarkable things, um, even as, as if we just focus on the negative and the negative is devastating, the thousands of species that have uh, gone extinct since the first Earth Day, for example. If we just tell that, that part of the story, we easily lose all the remarkable accomplishments that environmental scientists and conservation groups and, and in international organizations have accomplished to find meaningful and productive balances between uh, local communities and their environments that allow both to exist into the future in yeah. sustainable ways. And I think it's important that we keep in mind both stories, that ambivalence has, that middle course has to remain because that's what keeps us moving forward. Yeah. Um, so yes, come, please come and, and visit us here at the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum. We're gonna be uh, up through May 8th. Um, and uh, Beth and I would always be happy to give you a tour if you're in town. <laughs> uh, my dream is to uh, retire and spend my time around here 
bullying people into letting <laughs> me give them tours. So I'm, I'm just practicing for my retirement. Um, and while you're here, be sure to uh, stop at the gallery right next door. Uh, there's an amazing uh, exhibition up on the incredibly important and uh, tragically, I think, today um, under-recognized uh, uh, African-American cartoonist, Ollie Harrington, um, who worked for uh, decades in the, primarily in the African-American press, um, before moving first to France and then to East Germany, has an incredibly long career um, as a cartoonist exploring civil rights, exploring um, uh, kind of the kind of challenges and devastations of, of capitalism, particularly once he moved to East Germany and was reflecting back on uh, his former life in the United States. Um, but also just one of the most talented cartoonists. I mean, just could do anything and did so many different things. It's an amazing story um, and a lot of images that have never been seen before, uh, never been on exhibit anywhere. And I think that's open until May. That's, too. Yes, that's yep. also open until May. Yep. Um, and um, keep your eye out for it. It'll be up on the website soon. Um, over the next month, we'll be adding uh, supplementary material on the website, which will include also bibliographic information for many of the books featured in this exhibit and mm -hmm. lots of additional material. Exactly, stuff we couldn't put on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> a few, things, oh, okay. that, few okay. things that can't be on the wall and a few things that um, uh, actually work better in digital format because they yeah. were born digital. So yeah. there's been a lot of really great work in, in, um, in graphic comics journalism and in terms of web comics working in this area that'll be really fun to curate in a digital space as yeah. well.